Thank you very much. Thank you. You're always very kind. Uh, good evening. Good evening. I'm fine. I just want you to know that tonight uh, I'm here under tremendous duress. In fact, I was, there's so much duress in my life right now that seated in the back is the assistant to the cardiologist that I go to. <laughs> and she's here just in case something goes wrong. I have to be carried off somewhere. It's always nice to be with you, and it's my pleasure to share with you Mother Teresa. Uh, some of you have shared with me a picture of a woman at a very young age uh, that is reported to be Mother Teresa. My suggestion to you is this. Probably that is not true. It's not true for a couple of reasons. Hairstyle, makeup, clothing, and whether or not pictures, photographs was available when Mother Teresa was that age living in Albania is somewhat questionable. There was an awful lot that we know about her. And what I'd like to do tonight is give you an overview of her life. And then I would like to take the opportunity to suggest four or five concepts that come out of her life that I believe are essential for every age, especially the one in which we find ourselves. And so we begin with who was this woman? She was born in 1910. She was reportedly born on August 26. However, that date was in question for a number of years. Why? Simply this. She was baptized the day after she was born, August the 27th. As she matured in her faith, she began to believe that her baptism was indeed the beginning of her life. And so for her, the physicality of her birth did not matter to her. What mattered was the spiritual reality of her life that baptism suggested. She was the youngest child born to two parents who lived in Albania. She was a sickly child, probably suffered from some sort of asthma, certainly some sort of pulmonary disease. And her mother always believed that soon Agnes, that was her given name, and Agnes would soon be with God. And so this child grew up in this family with the notion that she would encounter God soon. She was a child who enjoyed going to church. She loved to go to Mass. And she shared in the mystique and the ministry and the music that the Mass embraced. She loved it. It was constant in her attendance. Her dad was an interesting guy. Her dad was a person today that we would call a huckster. He sold medicines, leather goods, cotton, all sorts of things all across Eastern Europe. He was also a man that today we would call a revolutionary. For he lived in a time in Albania when the struggles for power and the domination of militarism were very great. He was committed to a notion of a society in which all people, all people, were treated equally and fairly. And he had a reason for that. The Albania in which he lived was 90% Muslim. And so every Sunday, as he took his family to Mass, he counted on the benevolence, the kindness, and the inclusiveness of his Muslim brothers and sisters as they made their way to church. He met an interesting end. Uh, he became involved with what today we would call freedom fighters, revolutionaries. He became involved in establishing a culture in which education Art, music, faith, education for children would be prized and valued. On a business trip, he was invited to a dinner by some of his friends. Upon returning home, he very mysteriously died. The notion was that on that trip, at that dinner, 
because he was a progressive thinker, because he was a man of many talents, because he was a man who believed in the inclusiveness of life, that he was poisoned. And so, that action left his wife with three young children to raise. To be sure, to be sure, there were challenges. However, as Agnes grew up, she began to write a diary. And in that diary, there is this marvelous sentence that recurs over and over again. Wherever mother is, wherever mother is, there is home. Why would a child write that of her mother? Some of the things that we know about her mother can explain why. Her mother believed and practiced the concept of fair treatment. Her mother was an individual who believed in caring for the poor. Her mother was an individual who opened her home and her table to the poorest of the poor. And always she taught her children to treat others as they would wish to be treated. From her parents, Agnes, growing up, captured this magnificent sense of mystery about life. And the mystery was this, at Mass, God Christ is present. But then again, this mystery, in the use of language, promises and vows are made, then again, this mystery. Who is it that we care for whenever we find the poorest of the poor, the hungry, the left, the imprisoned, the forgotten? At the age of 18, Agnes decided that she would commit her life to the convent. She had a spiritual advisor, a Croatian priest, who had a love for the concepts of mission. And so he instilled in this young gal a sense of adventure that had about it the purpose of leaving the world a better place than this found. He taught her the value of music. He taught her to play the mandolin. And together they formed a choir for little kids who had nowhere else to be. He instilled in her a love of Christ because he taught her that first Christ had loved her. And he instilled in her the sense somehow making a commitment that would be lifelong. And so she announced to her mother at the age of 18 that she would enter a convent. The interesting thing about that decision and announcement is this. She had never seen a nun. She had never seen a convent. She simply fell in love with the concept of caring for the least of the least. Her mother did not consent and went into a time of retreat, locking herself in her room, trying to make the decision. When mother emerged from the room, Agnes was still afire with her commitment to the convent. And so it was that mother signed the consent. And at the age of 18, think about that. At the age of 18, this young girl boarded a train out of Kosovo 
destined for Paris. Once in Paris, she made her way to the seashore, and she traveled to Ireland, where the Loretta sisters had a convent that prepared young women to become nuns. She went there for primarily one reason. The Loretto's understood that English had become the language of the world. And therefore, all of their nuns, whether they came from Albania, Italy, France, Spain, didn't matter. They began their journey in Ireland, where they learned English. As she made her way through her, her studies, she took the name of Teresa. And the reason for that was, she was named after the great Spanish saint, Teresa, who was the patron saint of missionaries. She finished her work in Ireland, and she was sent to India. As I was reworking this, I was doing it in the context of what we have been seeing in India. And so it kind of impressed me with how overwhelming it must have been for this young 19-year-old girl to be confronted with the sheer mass of people, the divergence of culture, Hindu, Muslim, not to mention the poverty that was there. Her first vow was taken in May of 1931. And she was sent to a school, yes, to teach the children English. She was impressed with their ability to learn. But she was impressed with something more. She was impressed with the enormous poverty in which these children lived. In her diary that I mentioned earlier, she records this observation. In my country, meaning Albania, we worry about our children having shoes. In India, the concern is for their feet. That's the kind of poverty that this young nun teaching English in the foothills of the Himalayas began to observe. By May of 1937, she took her final and permanent vows. Poverty, of course, chastity, of course, and obedience. And somebody somewhere saw this young woman. And they decided that she had something to offer. And so as a promotion, they took her out of this little school near the Himalaya Mountains and they sent her to Calcutta. While she was in Calcutta, she met a wonderful man who was a priest. His name was Van Eckham. In fact, they had such a wonderful relationship. They enjoyed conversation and sharing ideas so much that her mother's superior, back in the convent, actually began to believe that this priest and this young nun were having an affair. How about that for paranoia? <laughs> so convinced was Mother Superior that the young woman was doing something terrible that she sent her away to a far distant asylum. Eckham fought to have her come back. Why? Because he realized that the needs in Calcutta were enormous. So she returned to Calcutta, and she would spend the next 20 years of her life as a Loretto sister, teaching children English, and after a while geography, and after a while mathematics, and after a while history, and after a while she began to teach these children that you did not have to eat garbage. 
There were alternatives. Every year, Sister Teresa returned to that small little convent at the foot of the Himalayas for a retreat. And one year, as she was making that journey, she had what she later called a call within a call. What did that mean? It simply meant that as she sat in this train, a dirty, crowded Indian train, she parted her vow. Chastity, <laughs> poverty, obedience. Then she began to think about those children whose feet were so diseased that they had to be amputated. So the call within the call said, it's not enough to live in the comfort of a convent, have a clean bed, a healthy diet, good care, cleanliness. It's not enough to live in the convent and touch these children with a kind of distance. The call within the call said, you must go and you must live. You must live with the poorest of the poor. And so she began very subtly to spend her Sunday gathering up gifts. And when we talk about gifts, ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking about you know PlayStations. We're talking about food and underwear and water. She gathered up gifts and she took them to these children in the southern end of the city of Calcutta. And after a while, Van Ettrick says that the world did not notice. But indeed, a, refor a reformation and a revolution had begun. He said that the revolution was this. Sister Teresa was very quietly becoming Mother Teresa. Very much in the tradition of that line in her diary. Wherever Mother is. There is home. After a while, the idea, the gifts, the going on Sunday took on a life of its own. And Mother Teresa, Sister Teresa, petitioned the church for her to be excused from her vows and begin an order within the order to care for these poorest of the poor children. One way to do that was to take an edict of secularization. The edict of secularization by the canon law of the church said, oh, you don't want to play by the rules of the organization anymore? Fine. You're out. No disgrace. No penalties. Just an absolving of the vow. But Sister Teresa said no. I wish to take another option. And that option allowed for a person, purpose, a person to take a year or two or three years still holding on to their vows, but pursuing other ways in which the vow might be implemented. Her first request to do that was rejected by the Archbishop of Calcutta. 
He told this upstart sister that she did not have the right to weaken the Loretto sisters. Unfortunately, the Archbishop did not realize what he was dealing with. <laughs> he looked at this young woman of small stature and thought that he had overwhelmed her. Not so. She returned a second time and made her application to be excused from her vows to the Loretto sisters for a period of a year while she considered her future. Interestingly enough, the Archbishop became very seriously ill just after talking with Sister Teresa. Sister Teresa took that as a sign. <laughs> and the sign was this. She would pray for the recovery of the Archbishop. And if the Archbishop recovered from his illness, that would be a sign from Almighty God that she should be granted her request. The Archbishop got better. The request was granted. Sister Teresa was released from her vows to the Loretta sisters. And that was the beginning beginning of the Sisters of Charity, which today develop the world. Notice how they dressed. It was a very simple white hat, made of the cheapest cloth she could find. It was trimmed in blue which is the color, the liturgical color, representing the Virgin Mary. And she went off to Calcutta, and she found a residence at 14 Creek Lane. Let me tell you about the residence. First of all, it was owned by a Muslim. Second of all, it had absolutely nothing in it. Mother Teresa brought to that address of 14 Creek Lane on the second floor a small chair, a bench, and a table. And there she lived by herself for the first year of being released from her vows to the Loretta sisters, trying to care for the needs of children. It was a hard year. The Archbishop refused, refused to give her any funding. So Mother Teresa was forced to wander the streets of Calcutta, begging for food. Her guiding principle was this, I only need enough to survive. She did. And after a while, for some younger students that she had been teaching in Calcutta began to wonder about where was Sister Teresa. And upon finding, them, finding her, they decided that they would align themselves with her. And suddenly the Archbishop discovered that he had a convulsion in the middle of his diocese. The heart of the convulsion, there was this little, small nun with the spirit of a giant. And around her, 13 young women who were willing to do the following. Number one, she requested of these young women total surrender of themselves to the goal of caring for the children. And anything that interfered in that totality of surrender would need to be eliminated. She also lived a lifestyle that was more than Spartan. 
They scrub their teeth with ashes from the fire. They wash their clothes in a common bucket. And all they were allowed to have in their possession was a change of clothing, undergarments, a pair of sandals, and a mattress. Now, when we talk about a mattress, ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking about giving what you and I need a lot when we go to the bins. Matter of fact, just a, just a little aside, we went to the bins a couple weeks ago to buy a new mattress. And when they brought it to the house, I thought they had brought something wrong. It was a, it was a, just a straight box. And as these young, young guys were carrying it, I said to the one guy, "We ordered a mattress." He said, "I know this is a mattress in a box." He said, "What do you mean it's in a box? You have to pump it up and let's go." No, 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 no. And it's not the body. You all know about this. The advisory system, they make the mattress, then they put it under tremendous pressure, and they package it in plastic. And when they bring the damn thing to you, guess what? They just open up the plastic, and the mattress just unfolds. And the young guy said, Don't do anything crazy for about four hours. <laughs> That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that thin bamboo, you know, that, you know, that is, that thin bamboo. And all it really is, is a layer, not of comfort, but of separation between a person asleep and the dirt on the floor. Whatever it was that Mother Teresa had, these young women were attracted by it. And they were infected with it. And by 1950, the Vatican saw fit to authorize the congregation of the Sisters of Charity and to designate not the Archbishop of Calcutta, but rather this little unassuming nun to be the leader the superior, the mother of that organization. By 1997, I'd like you to remember these numbers, by 1997, over 4,000 sisters had taken the vows of this order. The first three were traditional. Poverty, chastity, obedience. Ah, uh, but Mother Teresa had a fourth one. A joyful acceptance to share the poverty of the world. Uh, by 1998, Mother Teresa's work was all across the world. He was caring not only for those young women in Calcutta who were learning how to type so they could get a decent job. She was also caring for the old who were dying in the streets. She was caring for the people who were afflicted with diseases that left them without hope. She came to America and addressed the issue of AIDS. All across the world, that white simple habit trimmed in blue came a harbinger of hope. Mother Teresa died on September the 5th, 1997. Her casket lay in a state open for almost a week in Calcutta. That's how many people came to pay their respects. And you may remember that hers was a state funeral. She was driven through the city of Calcutta in a military vehicle, indicating the respect and the regard that the Indian government had for her. 
And you may remember this. At the state gathering for her final service, the Prime Minister of India said that Mother Teresa provided water from the Ganges to the Hindu. And she read from the Quran to the Muslim. She baptized with water the Christian. The one who had nothing. She gave the gift of dignity and death. Why a woman? This little soft-spoken nun from Albania. Now, just a few comments. As one deals with all of that, one comes away with a comment made by John, John Paul II. He once referred to Mother Teresa as one of the world's great mystics. Now, I think that when the Pope referred to Mother Teresa as a great mystic, he was not speaking about people who sit around a campfire wondering why there's air. <clears throat> I think he much more had in mind an aggressive, dynamic, energized kind of life. Didn't settle for what was. I like to think that maybe the Pope had in mind this concept of mysticism. It begins with an awakening. My gosh, there's a world out there. It continues with a purging of life. I don't need that anymore. That's a waste of time. And then there's a sense of illumination. Wow. That's how you get from there to there. Are you ready for this one? I'm not supposed to say stuff like this. There's the dark night of the soul. When you raise the question, is it worth it? And lastly, there is that sense of union with God that is different than anything we had ever considered. Mother Teresa was a mystic filled with energy, dynamic energy and power. Number two, she was also a woman of vows. She believed that when you gave your word, you kept it. She also believed that the giving of a vow meant total commitment. She believed that when you were willing to say yes, you had better be prepared to say yes, yes for the rest of your life. An interesting little bit of tid tidbits. In the Catholic Church, it takes about two hours to ordain a priest. If you're going to ordain a bishop, it's going to take you about four hours. The ordination of young women into the Sisters of Charity on average takes about six and a half hours. Why? Because the vows are celebrated. Three, Mother Teresa was also a person who did not care about the pomp and circumstance. She wasn't in all the religion games. She wasn't interested in being religious. She was much more interested in being spiritual. She did that with enormous grace and without a sense of judgment. She just simply said, that's okay. For example, Pope John Paul decided she needed a car. And so in the tradition of the Vatican, he bought and sent to Mother Teresa a Lincoln Continental car. She sold it and poured the money into her mission. Oh yeah, 
And then there was the late Cardinal Cook in New York, one of the richest dioceses in all of the world. And he sent her a check. She returned it, saying that perhaps the diocese needed it more than she. What was she telling him? Come on. Is this a gift? Or is this a token? Oh, when she came to the White House, and President and Mrs. Reagan entertained her in the state dining room. And as they sat in the splendor of that environment, Mother Teresa said to the president, Mr. President, are you aware that that large Idaho potato on your plate can feed an entire family in Calcutta? And of course, you all know that she won the Nobel Peace Prize. And she decided rather than having a fancy dinner in a hotel, all the proceeds that would have been used to buy that dinner should be sent to some program in the world where leprosy was an epidemic. And of course, there was the 1.6 million prize that went with it, too. There was some sense that perhaps that should be sent to Rome. And as of today, that money is still being used in Calcutta. She wasn't into religion. She wasn't into pomp and circumstance. She wasn't into games. She was into the kind of thing that really made her. <laughs> um, she also was a person that I think was very sacramental. She had great regard for the sacraments of the church. Uh, she was known to go to Mass several times a day. Because she said that whenever an individual had the opportunity to commune with Christ, one should take it. She once baptized a dying man who was a Hindu. A priest called attention to that and criticized her by saying he has no idea what that means theologically. She said, you're right. However, he knows it is passage to the next life. Um, Mother Teresa believed in and participated in regularly the sacramental life of faith. But she didn't stop there. Her sacrament was much larger than some water at the end of somebody's fingers. A sacrament was more than a cup of a host. A sacrament was more than liturgy. She once said, that every time one of those young women is given a typewriter and learns the, the ability to communicate, a sacrament has been celebrated. She also believed that when a dying man that nobody cared about reached out and was able to grasp a hand, a sacrament had occurred. Mother Teresa expanded, I think, for the world and for all of us, maybe, the meaning of the sacrament. As Malcolm Muggeridge, the great English reporter and writer, once said, he taught us again, she taught us again in the new. That perhaps the greatest sacrament is the least that we expect the sacrament. And I close with how her life came to a conclusion. A great deal has been written about some of the memoirs that she shared with her spiritual biography. 
Now, those memoirs had to do with that dark night of the soul. She had been walking around in Calcutta now for almost 40 years. And people were still dying of leprosy. AIDS was infecting that population at an enormous rate. Kids were dying of hunger, childhood diseases. And she shared with her spiritual biographer this thought. On the train, remember the train? Call within the call. Jesus called me to care for the poorest of the poor. And Jesus said, He would always be with me. Sometimes I feel alone. Sometimes too empty. Mother Teresa, in the last years of her life, endured what perhaps some of us have endured. When you empty yourself to the last ounce and nothing changes, <coughs> you might shed a tear or two. You might wonder what it meant. She also shared with her barb for these words. By blood, I am an Albanian. By citizenship, I am an Indian. By faith, I am a Catholic nun. By calling, I belong to the world. As to my heart, even in the darkest of the dark, I give it to Jesus. You see, for Mother Teresa, Jesus was a historical figure. Jesus was a Lord and Savior. Jesus was all of the things that the church has taught us Jesus is. Ah, but Jesus was a martyr. Jesus was that man reaching out with a hand saying, I'm dying. Jesus was that child whose feet were diseased. Jesus was the hungry man and woman who lived in the streets. Mother Teresa, she once said that she did not believe that Jesus was crucified between two candles. But rather, he was crucified between two thieves amid the reality of human suffering. So I give you Mother Teresa, a woman daughter, a nun, pilgrim, and perhaps most of all, an example. Thank you. I don't know what your schedule is. If I'm going too long, I apologize. Hey, but you signed up, so you know what I'm doing. <laughs> um, but if somebody has a question, I'd be delighted to have it be expressed. And I would uh, reiterate it. So if you know, anybody have a question? Uh, oh, over here. I want to know how she learned to speak English. My friend from Albania didn't speak English. She learned to speak English in that convent in Ireland. That's why she went there. Yeah, she went there, and that was the primary focus of her education in Ireland, was to learn the English language because it was the language of the Loreto systems. Yeah. Yeah, just that system. And by the way, at the time of her death, she was fluent in five languages. Five languages. You may have noticed I have trouble getting to English. Anybody else? Please, sir. How did you get interested in Mother Teresa? I dated her in high school. No, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I have been, I have lived a blessed life. I really have. Um, I'm a cancer survivor. I was blessed by two parents. That I can never repay. I've been married to a woman for 60 years. Who makes Joe look like a piper. <laughs> Um, I have great health care provided for me. Um, and in that journey, you know what I've learned? I've learned we all read out different books and we sing different songs and we have different traditions and we use different images and different languages, but at the end of the day, we're pretty much all the same. We want somebody to be there at some time. If you've ever had a sick kid, you know you want a physician, a caregiver, who's going to help. If you've ever been alone, in a crowd, you want somebody who will listen. So I became interested in Mother Teresa as a role model. Um, and that interest for me began about almost 50 years ago now. Um, in my tradition, I'm a Methodist, don't hold that against me, but I'm a, I'm a Methodist, and the way we elect traditions is that we have these meetings every four years, and by the guidance of God's Holy Spirit, we elect people to be bishops. Now, I was on a fast track. I wanted that job. And uh, I was nominated. And the process begins like this. Well, Dr. Opperly, it's just, you're just such a nice guy, Dr. Opperly. We're just wondering, Dr. Opperly. Yeah, why is it? It's Jack. Um, how do you feel about women in the clergy? So I said, I haven't really thought much about it, excepting that two of my associates at the First Methodist Church in Pittsburgh happen to be women. And you know something? They're really good. Oh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Opperly. My ballot count went from 285 to 247. Oh, there was a second meeting. How do you feel about black people in the church? You go down real fast. See, I never thought about it. As a matter of fact, I went to Shenley High School. In the Shenley High School, man, there was black, there was yellow, there was white, there was Catholic, there was Jew, there was nothing. And when it came time to fight, and I mean fight, I'm not talking about, you know, exchange vulgarities, I'm talking about fists. The Westinghouse kids, we all hung together. Oh, thank you, Dr. Robert You know what happened to my boat time, don't you? I got the toilet. I'll tell you something. In that moment, the one person I had been reading about came into focus with me. Right here. Right here. That's how I got there. And I, I benefited. I, 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 want to, I, I want to rephrase that. I hope that my life has benefited from the model that this woman sets. She has taught me that when I raise the host and say the body of Christ, the chalice, the blood of Christ, those two hands have not restricted someone. Because they're young, old, black, and white, gay, or straight, or participating in the body of Christ. I hope that gives you some indication as well. Anybody else? Well, guys with cameras always make me nervous, so I'm going to get out of here right now. We'll see you. Thank you very much.